If you want to follow along in your Bibles, turn to Genesis 48, chapter, verse 1 through 11. Soon after this, Joseph was brought to work, and his father was gravely ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to see Jacob. And when Jacob was told that his son Joseph had come to see him, he gathered his strength and he sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, The all-powerful God appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan many years ago and spoke his blessing, blessing over me, telling me, I am going to make you fruitful and multiply your descendants so that you will give rise to nation after nation. I will give this land to them after you to have as their possession forever. So Joseph, your two sons who were born to you in Egypt before I came here are mine. I claim Ephraim and Manasseh as my own, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. As for any children your father after them, your father after them, you may regard them as your own. When it comes time for other children to gain their inheritances, they will be given land within the regions granted to their brothers Ephraim and Manasseh. When I left Padan, your mother, Rachel, died on our journey in the land of Canaan. We were not far from Ephrath, so I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, which is also known as Bethlehem. Just then Israel noticed Joseph's sons. Jacob, and Jacob said, And who are these? And Joseph said, They're my sons, Father, whom God has given to me here in Egypt. Will please bring them here to me so I can lay my hands on them and bless them. Israel's eyes were dim because of his old age, so he couldn't see well. Joseph brought the boys near to him, and Israel kissed them and hugged them warmly. And Jacob said to Joseph, I didn't know if I would ever see your face again, but now God has given me more than I hoped. He has let me see your children, too. Continuing on in verse 12. Then Joseph moved the boys aside. They bent at his father's knees, and he bowed down low with his face to the ground. Then Joseph took his sons and brought them near to his father. He took his younger son Ephraim in his right hand and put him to the left hand of Israel. And he took Manasseh in his left hand and put him to the right hand of Israel. So Israel stretched out his hands and crossed his arms, laying his right hand on the head of Ephraim, the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, the firstborn. And he spoke this blessing over Joseph. May the God before whom my ancestors Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all of my life and still to this day, the messenger who has rescued me from all harm, bless these boys, and let my name be perpetuated, perpetuated through them, as well as the name of my ancestors, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a great multitude of people throughout the world. When Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was troubled, so he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's. No, father, since this, this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But Israel... Manasseh will also become a people, and he will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his children will give rise to many nations. So it was that Israel blessed Joseph and his sons that day. Jacob said, When the people of Israel speak blessings, they don't remember you. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So this is how Israel ranked Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. And Jacob turned and said to Joseph, Look, I'm about to die. But I know that God will be with you and he will bring you back to the land of your ancestors someday. I am going to hand down to you more land than I give to your brothers. You will inherit a mountain ridge that I seized from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. This is the word of the Lord.
Last year, October, I went to a conference called Catalyst. Everybody say Catalyst. Catalyst. And uh, while I was there, uh, I sat with 13,000 other pastors and preachers and leaders and ministers of all varieties, volunteers, paid staff, everybody. And uh, we soaked in some really great, insightful teaching, learning, music, worship. And uh, while I was there, I only bought two books. I got a lot of books that were handed to me free, but I only bought two. This book, Demon Wide by Andy Stanley, and another one, Demon Wide by Andy Stanley. Two copies of the same book. See, Andy is uh, a communicator pastor down in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, he's a, a guy, a pastor that has greatly influenced me as far as his preaching, his messages, his style uh, go. He's uh, some Charles Stanley, some of you might know that name. Uh, and just a really, really great teacher. And uh, so I respect him a lot. I, I, I appreciate what he has to say, and, and I, I respect him. And so Andy was the key speaker at this conference. He was going to speak twice, the first session and the last session. So the first session wrapped up. Andy, another home run out of the park, did a great job. And they said, well, Andy's going to be down out in the parking lot at a, at a table if anybody would like to talk with him, get a picture, have him sign anything, whatever. So I took my little book out there. And I got it signed by Andy Stanley. <laughs> now, that means absolutely nothing to you guys, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's OK. Andy Stanley's autograph is not worth anything. In fact, it probably lowered the value of the book because now it has writing in it. <laughs> but it means something to me, right? It holds sentimental value to me. This is the copy that I don't want to doubt, right? The other one I let other people read. You're free to read it, and I highly encourage it. That one doesn't get handed out. Why? Because this book is no longer common or ordinary because his name gives it value. It's no longer common or ordinary because his name gives it value. Today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 48. If you haven't turned in a Bible, I encourage you to do that. Genesis 48. Today we're talking about names, talking about God's autograph. And if you've been following us in Genesis, if you've been traveling on this journey with us over the last year, you know names are a big deal, right? We've talked about it a couple times, a couple different angles. Names are a huge deal in this book of Genesis. This book that essentially helps us to understand the foundations of our faith, helps us to understand why things happened the way that they did, helps us to get a, an idea of the beginning of God's promise for humanity. And Jacob's family especially was very familiar with names. You remember Jacob's grandpa, Abram, right? Abram and his wife, Sarai. Yeah, we remember Abram and Sarai. They would eventually get new names, right? They would be known as Abraham and Sarah. Everybody say Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. They got new names. Now, after them, uh, Jacob himself, right? He got a new name. There was one night he was wrestling with God and his physical reality, his tension about being uh, reunited with his brother Esau, that was kind of riling him up, getting him nervous. And so he had this vision, this encounter with God and his spiritual reality and his physical reality met and he wrestled with God all night long. Everybody say all night long. All night long. And remember that night, he got a new name, Jacob did. Jacob was no longer the heel grabber, uh, the mischievous one, the, the, the clever one, the trickster. He was known as Israel. Everybody say Israel. Israel. You guys are getting good at this, like practice or something. <laughs> Israel. He gets a new name from God. A name that means you have struggled with man and with God and you have overcome. And who can forget, who can forget our good friend, Zephanoth Paneah. 
Zatanopania. You get Nobody remembers Zatanopania. How could you forget about Zatanopania? We've been talking about Zatanopania for the last several weeks. There once was a man named Joseph. He had some troubles. Ended up in Egypt. He understood dreams, thanks to God. And uh, the Pharaoh, remember the Pharaoh? Funny hat. Pharaoh had some funny dreams, and he needed somebody to interpret them. He calls in Jacob, or Joseph, excuse me, calls in Joseph to interpret. Joseph interprets. Pharaoh elevates him to the second in command in all of Egypt, and he gives him all this power, a wife, and he gives him a new name, an Egyptian name, Zephanah Benita. But nobody remembers that name, do we? So today, we are talking about names and the importance of names and how they affect us. This church on its own has had its share of names, right? Uh, if you're familiar with the church's history, way back when, we were Masonic Congregational Church. Right? And I'm probably going to skip some, so if there are others that I'm missing, please don't hit me. Uh, Mazan Congregational Church became Park Street Congregational Church. Park Street Congregational Church then became Park Street Congregational United Church of Christ. And because that's kind of a mouthful, we just took to calling it Park Street Church. We know what it's like to have a rich family heritage and to have a variety of names, don't we? Names are important. They give us value. And so we come to Genesis chapter 48. Hopefully you're there by now. Genesis 48. And Jacob is dying. Now this is no surprise to anybody. Jacob is an old man. He's like 140-ish at this point. He's an old guy. He's put a lot of mileage on his body. And Jacob, you'll remember, throughout his life is constantly thinking it's over. Right? Joseph uh, is gone, and he thinks, oh, no, my life is over. I'm going to go down to the grave. There's a the threat of losing his other son, Benjamin, and no, oh, no, I'm going down to the grave. He gets reunited, and he meets the Pharaoh, and he says, well, I'm glad that I met you, and I'm glad that I'm reunited with my son, because I'm going to die soon. I mean, that, that's kind of Jacob's recurring message. It's all over for me. And so he gets to where he knows, right? It's no longer he's upset. It's no longer he thinks it's over. He can feel it. He's sick, and he doesn't seem to be pulling out of it. And so he takes care of business. Now, Jacob and his family, they, they're they used to this, right? When his grandpa Abraham, everybody say Abraham. Abraham. When Abraham was dying, the last thing that he wanted was to make sure that his son Isaac would have a, have a wife. So the promise of God could continue. When Isaac was dying, he wanted to make sure that all of his sons, Esau and Jacob, excuse me, would also have wives, that their families would continue, that God's promise would go on. And now Jacob, who has several sons, one daughter, wants to make sure that all of God's business is taken care of before he dies. Are you completing what God has called you to do in this lifetime? Or do you keep pushing it back and pushing it back? And so Jacob, he knows his time is short. And he starts to, to get up and he realizes it's tough. So he calls in Joseph. He calls in the two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. Everybody say Ephraim, Ephraim. and Manasseh. Manasseh. He calls them in. And they can tell, you know, Grandpa Jacob just isn't doing that good. But Jacob, he wants to be strong in front of the boys, so he sits up in bed. And he starts telling the story. There was this time when I was at Luz. You remember Luz? You've seen it on a map. When I was at Luz, God spoke to me and he gave me this promise. A promise that he had told my grandpa and my dad before me. He said, Jacob, you are going to inherit this land. It's all going to be yours. I'm going to make you a blessing. 
And in fact, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to have lots and lots of children. Your, your family will be the bricks that lay the foundation of a nation. And that promise is carried forward in you guys. And so he, he brings the voice forward and he tells Joseph, Joseph, listen, you have taken on the role of firstborn now. I know you weren't born first, but you, uh, you were born of Rachel. Remember, Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife, the one whom he really loved. He said, Joseph, you are now the firstborn. Reuben, I know he was born first, but he did a lot of things in his past. You remember Reuben? Uh, Reuben actually slept with one of Jacob's wives. Not a good way to get on dad's good side. And so, you know what? You've lost status as firstborn. Joseph's taking on that role now. And he's, he goes on to say, your boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh? Ephraim and Manasseh. Your boys are going to take on the roles of second and third born. Now this is a huge deal, right? Grandpa Jacob is adopting his grandkids to be his sons. It's a huge deal. They will be known as sons of Israel. Jacob knows that God is good on his promises, and he's going to make this thing really explode here in the next few generations. And he wants these two boys to be a part of that. Having Jacob's name on them, God's name on them, means that they're no longer common or ordinary. But they're valuable. What are some of the things that you've signed your name to? What have you signed your name to? Think about it. We sign our name to all sorts of things, right? When I was in sixth grade, I traced, traced a picture of the Los Angeles Lakers logo. My classmates thought it was the best thing ever, and they wanted me to autograph it. <laughs> I traced it. And, and so I didn't have a signature at that point. I was using cursive like everybody else was. So I was like, OK, I've seen signatures. They're cool. So I need to figure this out. So literally, I sat down at home and practiced on creating a signature that would look cool. And I still use it to this day. <laughs> We sign our names to all sorts of things, right? Things that we consider valuable. Things that we consider important. Some of us have uh, signed our names to checks, right? The check has no value unless it's signed, right? Some of us sign our names to mortgages. The mortgage has no value. Uh, the housing market's doing much better now, but... Some of us have signed our names to all sorts of things. Licenses, certificates, all sorts of legal documents. And none of those documents mean a thing until they're signed, right? By signing something, you say, this stands in my place. This represents me. This is something important to me. This has value. This has purpose. This serves as a witness to what I believe in. Things give value when we write our name on them. So Jacob, he blesses the boys, he adopts them as his own. And Joseph is now firstborn. Everybody say firstborn. Firstborn. And firstborn boys get extra stuff. That's just how it works. And I think it's a pretty good system. <laughs> firstborn boys get twice as much as everybody else. So out of everything, they get two-thirds, and the rest is divided up. So when it came time for dinner, they would get twice as much. When it came time for inheritance, they would get twice as much. And so Jacob is on his deathbed, literally. And he says, Joseph, you're now the firstborn. You've taken over. And at the end of Genesis chapter 48, he says, I'm going to give you an extra piece of land. You're going to have more land than everybody else. It's a mountain ridge that I took in a battle against the Amorites. See, up to this point, we don't even know that Jacob's a warrior. But apparently, he conquered the Amorites at some point and gained this huge chunk of land in the mountains. And the other two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. Everybody say Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh. Yeah. 
Ephraim and Manasseh, they get to be sons of Israel. Now, how many people know that Israel is a nation? Okay. Israel, before it was a nation, was a kingdom. Before it was one whole kingdom, and after it was one whole kingdom, uh, it was made up of 12 regions. Regions that were named after, Joseph, after Jacob's sons. And you think, okay, well, what happened to Simeon's region? He was the original secondborn. What happened to Levi's region? He was the original thirdborn. Well, Simeon and Levi did something dastardly also. Remember way back when uh, their sister Dinah had uh, some confusion with a, a young king. He raped her. And Simeon and Levi got their revenge and they charged into a city and they slaughtered all the men. Do you remember that? And jo uh, Jacob said, why have you done this? This was wrong. This was, I know what they did was wrong, but this was worse. And so Simeon and Levi, they get kicked out. Levi and his tribe, his descendants, wouldn't actually have a region in the kingdom. They would have a few scattered cities that they would call their own. And Simeon, Simeon, he didn't have a region for very long. His region got sucked up into Judah's region. So by the time the history is all said and done, these boys don't have, these two don't have any regions, but Ephraim and Manasseh do. And so Jacob adopts them as his own. And Joseph is upset. Now, Joseph doesn't get displeased at hardly anything that his dad does. Right? Joseph and Jacob are like this. They are close. You remember Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors. Uh, Joseph was so excited to introduce his dad to the Pharaoh. They had this really close relationship. And yet, Joseph is displeased by this. See, he sets his boys down. And he puts his oldest son at Jacob's right hand. He puts his younger son at Jacob's left hand. That way the older son would get the most blessing. And Jacob, in one last mischievous little act, crosses his arms, blesses Ephraim first, and then Manasseh. Joseph tries to move his dad's arms, and Jacob says, I know what I'm doing. This is the right thing to do. God wants this to happen. And it's not the first time that the younger son has been blessed over the older, has it? So Joseph is displeased. He didn't like the way that Jacob was blessing. Didn't like the way that he was placing God's name on one son over the other. Have you ever tried to tell God what to do? Ever tried to tell God who to put his name on, who to bless? My hometown church, when I was in uh, early college, uh, I was still worshiping, worshiping at Ramsey. And one Sunday, this guy walks in, he was my age, from my class. And he walked in, and this kid, I can say kid, because in my memory he's younger than I am now. This kid was not Christian material, right? I knew all about his past. I knew the type of person that he was. I knew that he didn't deserve all of this. That's what I knew. Have you ever done anything like that? See somebody and they, they walk into church or they walk into a, uh, a Christian convention, they walk into your workplace and you look them up and down and you say, God, man, I, I'm not even going to say anything because this, this person doesn't deserve you. They aren't going to fit in with the church scene. Don't waste your time on them. How dare I? How dare we choose who God is going to bless? Choose who God is going to put his name on? It's not our place. Romans tells us for all of us and fallen short of the glory of God. 
except for the people at Park Street Church. No. It says all, meaning all. We're all on the same page. It's not our place to say, you get in, you get in, you get in, and you don't get in. <coughs> Jeremiah, chapter 31, says this. Jeremiah 31, verse 33 says... This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins. No more. God has written his name on your heart. His name. His name gives us value. We're no longer common or ordinary. His name saves us. So what are you doing to honor? Because remember, the things that bear our names are representatives of us. And so if we bear God's name, that means we represent Him. Is His name worth anything to you? Is it valuable? In his book, Alter Ego, Craig Rochelle talks a little bit about this, and I'll close with this if you'll just bear with me. Bat was valuable only because Babe Ruth's name was on it. 
Since he made it valuable, the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. If you're a Christian, what makes you valuable is the name of Jesus written on your heart. Because of what he did for us on the cross, our only reasonable response is to do something with our lives that honors him. Sadly, the Bible describes a truth that is much more common. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That won't be us. That won't be you. We will not be a generation that gives God only lip service. Instead, we'll show him honor from our hearts. It's because of what he did that we are who we are. We should value others and show them honor, and we should help them see that they were valuable enough for Jesus to give his life for us. Living with honor reminds us of who we really are, who God is, and how much he loves those around us. When we place our selfish egos on the altar of honor, we become aware of the value that God places on each and every life, including our own. God has written his name on our hearts. He gives us value. How are you honoring his autograph? We're going to sing a song that you heard a little bit earlier called Your Name.